All right, let's get started. So the learning objectives of the module, um, having done an experiment, a sequencing experiment, you have detected maybe dozens or maybe hundreds or even thousands of uh, genome variants, uh, and you really want to interpret them of, in the context of what they might be doing in the, in the cancer biology. And so the, the learning objectives of the module would be understanding what uh, variant annotations there are out there and how we can use them, and uh, how do we uh, predict the impact of a particular genome variant given various machine learning tools and uh, mathematical uh, models out there. And then in the practical session you'll learn to use a particular annotation tool called ANOVAR uh, which you can use in order, in order to translate uh, genomic coordinates to protein coordinates and then further understand of uh, what the variants may be doing in the context of, uh, of that protein's function. <coughs> So when we have uh, performed um, next generation sequencing of cancer genomes and extracted all these variants, and some of those variants will be related to genes and others will be related to um, intergenic regions, uh, we have to consider information at two levels of, uh, of organization or logic. Uh, one is, uh, is on the level of gene. Once we have identified a gene of interest that seems to be mutated frequently, then we can ask whether the gene is related to a process involving cancer, such as apoptosis or cell cycle. Uh, and we can investigate whether the gene is, uh, is known to be uh, sensitive to perturbation. For example, we have CRISPR and SHRNA screens out there that we can uh, use to understand uh, the gene's function. But before going to the level of a particular gene, we really want to know the, level, the, the impact of a variant. The variant may affect the gene, it may affect the coding region of a gene, or maybe it affects a gene that doesn't even uh, produce a protein, so it's a non-coding RNA. And all these things uh, we can do using various bioinformatics tools, and we'll walk through some of them in the following lecture. So when we have, inter we have different evidences about uh, uh, variants uh, in the genomes, in particular cancer genomes, then there are several different facets that we can look at. Uh, one is variant recurrence, so it's a very powerful a powerful concept that if you if you analyze many cancer genomes of un, unrelated individuals, these are the somatic genomes. If a variant tends to re recur or, or occur in many of these cancer patients independently, then uh, it might be a driver variant. Um, this is because the genome is a large and lonely space. So if a mutation happens to affect the same region over and over again, then it might be a driver mechanism. On the other hand, once we have identified a gene, we may start to build biological stories or hypotheses of what that gene may be doing, if it's uh, activated by a mutation or repressed by a mutation, and then we look at the pathway and network context, which is part of the second lecture. But right now, we're more interested in a particular variant, so a single nucleotide variant uh, or an indel in a gene, and we want to predict what that indel is doing in order to uh, affect that gene biologically, or maybe it has no role whatsoever. In the genome, we have um, many strange things, in particular in, the, in cancer genomes, um, and we can classify them uh, by their size. Uh, that's one of the simplest classifications. Uh, so on the small scale, that's probably a single nucleotide, or maybe dozens of nucleotides, maybe up to 50. Uh, the most common variant uh, type is the single nucleotide variant. It's one base pair substitution, where one letter of the DNA alphabet is replaced by another letter. Uh, these single nucleotide variants are probably the most high confidence data that we can extract from cancer genomes. Various algorithms are out there that detect single nucleotide variants, uh, and many times these, uh, these algorithms agree upon each other's output, so it's easy to form a consensus uh, set of uh, variants that appear in a, um, in a genome of interest. Uh, small indels uh, are insertions and deletions, uh, sometimes um, you know, a few nucleotides, sometimes a little more. And these are more challenging to detect, uh, and various algorithms don't agree as well uh, on, the, on their different outputs. So the more stringent analysis would combine the output of various indel calling algorithms and uh, get a consensus uh, analysis. We are mostly focusing on the small indels in this lecture, in particular the single nucleotide variants, but also uh, smaller indels. On the medium range of hundreds to thousands of base pairs, we have uh, different types of elements such as insertions, deletions, uh, inversions, translocations, and so on. And sometimes there are complex rearrangements that combine multiple types of these, um, uh, these uh, alterations in cancer genomes. 
these are the most challenging to detect uh, because the algorithms you know look at various things the, the detection of these different el uh, elements and the modifications and uh, rearrangement is also due to the sequencing length so ma many times they don't uh, cover the entire read and when you map these types of medium-sized elements to genes you don't necessarily use entire coordinates of genes and the rearrangements but maybe you see if a particular rearrangement only captures a a fragment of the gene and you could already start to hypothesize how it affects the gene itself uh, and on the large end uh, we talk about copy number alterations uh, you know one of the thresholds could be 5 kb or more sometimes copy number alterations um, affect entire chromosomes or chromosomal arms so we use cytobands in order to annotate them uh, to the genome Copy number variants are relatively easy to detect using uh, microarray platforms and a little bit more challenging to detect next generation sequencing. Okay, so when we start to look at variant annotations, uh, there are various steps that we need to do in these pipelines or various components that we need to understand. One of those components uh, is the data that we use for mapping these uh, uh, different variants. Uh, when we find the variant in the cancer genome, we first want to relate that back to the existing knowledge. And for that, we have uh, various databases, such as the Thousand Genomes uh, database, uh, the ESP6500 project, or the exact consortium dataset, that essentially tell us how frequent the variant that we found uh, has been found earlier in, in, in studies, in particular healthy individuals. Now, there are other databases that capture uh, Cancer genome sequencing, COSMIC is one of them. It's a mixed bag of various genome studies. It could be uh, smaller scale studies from earlier days uh, or very recent uh, whole genome with whole exome sequencing studies. Uh, now, step number two, uh, once you figured out how frequent the mutation is in, a, in an existing data set, you really want to map it to genes because uh, the entire genome has many different things and genes are um, definitely among the more interesting ones. But you don't really map your variants only to genes, but genes have different components to them as well, like untranslated regions and protein coding regions and promoters and perhaps enhancers. Uh, once you have mapped them, uh, mapped your regions to genes or decided that they don't overlap any gene at all, uh, you may want to predict the impact uh, of any given variant uh, considering the features of DNA around that variant. And there's a, a number of different tools and algorithms that do that. For example, SIFT and Bolufen and Mutation Assessor are, are some. Uh, these uh, focus on protein coding sequence. And there are other effect scoring methods. For example, CAD is a method that provides a score <coughs> for every nucleotide position in the genome. So it, it provides literally billions of scores. Um, and then there are many other uh, ways to interpret uh, coding and non-coding variation. This is a very active uh, topic of research. For example, you could look at splicing regulatory predictions, or you could look at <coughs> transcription factor bound regions in the DNA from ENCODE, make predictions of whether these uh, uh, mutations perhaps alter gene regulatory motifs, and so on and so forth. <coughs> All right, so the first step um, uh, that we should discuss is the variant annotation databases and allele frequencies. Uh, one, of the one of the first and uh, most important large-scale projects is the 1,000 Genomes Project, which is no longer a 1,000 Genomes Project because they, their latest phase contains 2,500 individuals. Uh, the goal of this project is to capture uh, human genome variants that occur at the relatively high frequency, so more than 1% of the uh, human population in various ethnic groups. Uh, for example, you know, Europeans and Latin Americans, Africans, uh, Asians, and so forth. Mm. And then this project is focused on the entire genome, uh, but the, the entire genome is large, so the coverage of the entire genome is somewhat lower, and then the ex ex exomic, regions, uh, exomic regions are covered at, uh, at a higher rate. Another dedicated project that's focusing on exomic uh, regions is the ESP project. Uh, 6,500 individuals have been profiled in that data set. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, it's important to know that that data set doesn't necessarily include only healthy individuals. The goal of the project is to discover cardiovascular disease and lung disease and blood disease, uh, variants that are uh, perhaps low frequency, less than 1%. So if in your study you are using that data set as a filter, you just uh, 
I need to pay attention to that this is not necessarily healthy uh, variation. Some of the variations that you capture may be overrepresented relative to the general population because you're ultimately looking at the disease cohort. Um, now, EXAC is a very uh, recently published data set that uh, the goal is to uh, capture the largest exome sequencing data set ever. This is about 10 times more data uh, of an individuals than the previous data set, uh, 60,000 unrelated individuals. And again, these are not necessarily healthy people. Uh, they, the cohort includes various disease cohorts. Uh, so they have uh, tried to capture every possible exome sequencing data set and process it uniformly. So when you use that as a control group, for example, then just acknowledge that these variants may be disease variants as well. <coughs> On the other hand, dbSNP is not uh, a single uh, study uh, that has been processed uniformly, but it's more like a metadatabase of various different studies that have been accumulated over time. Uh, that includes submissions before and after the next generation sequencing era. So you could see that some of them will be small and based on maybe some ancient sequencing technologies, and then others are really high throughput uh, next generation sequencing and whole genomes. Now, it includes polymorphisms found in the general population. So it's a database of healthy individuals, but at the same time, it includes disease associated individuals and also cancer. So it is a good re resource to look out, up your variants and maybe study them in detail. But the moment you start using it as a filter, you may, you may be filtering out something important. For example, because it contains somatic variants in cancer, if you discard anything that comes from dbSNP, you may actually you know, remove some interesting results from your data. Moving on to COSMIC. Uh, COSMIC is a reference set of, uh, of anything, uh, any mutations have, that have been discovered in, uh, in cancer genomes. And similar to dbSNP, it contains earlier submissions and later submissions, and it's a mixed bag of various studies. And so again, when using it as a filter, you should be paying attention. On the other hand, if you find a really interesting variant uh, in your data as well as COSMIC, you should follow up on it. Because recurrence is such a powerful feature in detecting cancer genomes, just go, go out there and count how many studies actually found that variant. If it's just a single study or a single patient, it's likely to be less important for your research. Uh, if it was found in dozens of patients and many different types of cancer, it's likely to be more important. If you find a, a mutation that overlaps with a cosmic database, uh, go and see if that particular nucleotide has been frequently mutated. Or if the nucleotide isn't um, a hotspot mutation, uh, maybe the entire gene is frequently mutated. If a gene is frequently mutated, it may be indicating that it's an important cancer driver gene. Uh, however, there are some genes that are apparently very frequently mutated, but they're not, long, they're not cancer genes. An example would be the Titan gene that is an enormously large gene and will contain a lot of mutations, but none of them have statistical significance. All right, so once we, yes? Can I just ask one question about the metadatabases? Like, if the reference genome is changing over time, are they updating the variants, or? Uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you for sure, but this is an important aspect to pay attention to. If your uh, variants that you have been annotating to one genome version you need to make sure that the, the database that you're looking at is also using the same reference version. I just wonder how that changes over time. Like, mm -hmm. if there's, like, could their variants increase or decrease in significance? Or how? I would say that the databases will come in different uh, setups. Okay. So there will be an, an ensemble database that uses the reference genome 37, and another ensemble version that will be using uh, the reference genome 38. So if if your annotation pipeline went through 37, you may need to make sure that you also use 37 for follow-up interpretation. Otherwise, they won't match at all. Right. Uh, any other questions? Um, just going to say about that DBC slide where you said about the three B flag variants. Um, it's a caution with your reference. So, uh, just to make sure I understand it correctly, if you're using the DBC as a filter. Of the not so interesting variants, mm -hmm. 
um, GBSCOOP also has some community flag, yes, are, like the cosmic data, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what you said we should be careful. Exactly. You don't want to throw them, you don't want to throw them up, out because. Uh, if you took dbSNP as a repository of healthy variation, mm -hmm. then that wouldn't be entirely correct because there is also disease annotated variation in there. All right. Once we have established uh, uh, the frequency of variants, perhaps in the in the healthy population, or whether these variants have been associated to some cancer samples earlier, we definitely want to ask whether some, which variants are associated to genes or various regulatory regions of these genes and which variants are clearly intergenic and perhaps noise or at least more difficult to interpret. So when we talk about genes, most of the time we talk about protein coding genes, right? There's about 20,000 of them in the human genome and that number fluctuates uh, every once in a while. But there's also a large number of genes um, that are not responsible for coding any proteins. So there are non-coding genes uh, that are further divided into classes like microRNAs or long non-coding RNAs or long intergenic non-coding RNAs and so on and so forth. And I think according to the latest high confidence counts, the, n the number of long non-coding RNAs is similar to the number of protein coding genes. So we shouldn't underestimate uh, these sets of genes. However, uh, they are likely be they are likely functionally differently important, and there's also vastly different knowledge that's available. So much more is known about protein coding genes. So much less is known about uh, non coding genes. And probably some of those non coding genes are also artifacts of just pervasively transcribed regions that are not very functional in cells. Um, and when we focus more on um, Protein coding genes, they come with different segments or elements of types of blocks in, in these genes that are responsible for various things. So first, uh, on both um, ends of the gene, you'll see untranslated regions that get tra transcribed, but they don't get translated and part of the protein. Coding exons are probably the most interesting ones for variant interpretation because they end up being folded into proteins and active in cells. Uh, introns get spliced out, they are, they are not translated, but they may contain some interesting uh, regulatory elements. And splice sites are, are ultimately responsible for selecting which exons uh, get incorporated in the particular cell type and which ones don't. But besides these clearly protein coding elements, um, we have other parts of the genome that may be relevant for our genes of interest. For example, upstream and downstream regions of the gene may be interesting. In particular, promoter regions that are upstream or transcription start site may be interesting for um, understanding genome variation, but they are probably way more difficult to interpret uh, and say exactly what they may be doing uh, in order to uh, um, affect the protein function. And finally, probably the largest amount of uh, variants that you detect are intergenic. You can't really uh, say what they're doing because they're far away from any genes or non-coding RNAs. All right, when we do um, annotation of uh, variants to genes, then many cases it's really simple. There is a gene or there's no gene under your variant of interest. But uh, there are situations where that gets a little bit more complicated. For example, there could be a protein coding gene that partially overlaps with an non-coding RNA. And then the question is, which information do you really care about? Uh, when you use the ANOVAR system, the ANOVAR has constructed a set of priorities in order to annotate variants. So the most uh, important variants in this priority system are those that affect protein sequences, so exons. And right after exons uh, and splice sites come the non-coding RNAs. So if a particular variant seems to be affecting um, part of a gene, but that's not a protein coding gene, then the next step would be to see if that overlaps uh, a non-coding RNA. And after the non-coding RNA, the next set of priorities lies under untranslated regions. After untranslated regions come the introns, then the upstream regions, and finally anything that's intergenic. But you can also ask ANOVAR to report all these potential effects. So this is worth uh, paying attention to if your uh, field of interest is non-coding RNAs and you use ANOVAR out of the box. You may lose a lot of information just because ANOVAR will give priority to coding sequence. Um, here's an example of how that really works. Um, 
on the up upper panel, you'll see a protein coding gene G1. Uh, the larger or taller blocks correspond to exons, and uh, the narrower blocks correspond to UTRs. And then there's also another gene uh, under, the, under the latter part of the gene, which is a non-coding RNA gene, NCR1. Now, when we use ANOVAR in order to interpret the uh, genome variation, then anything that's uh, in orange will be annotated as part of the protein coding gene. So you see all these blocks that correspond to UTRs or exons or splice sites or introns, they will, all the orange areas will be, will be associated with a gene of interest if any variants occur in these regions. However, in the blue areas, uh, the situation gets a little bit more complicated uh, because the blue area corresponds to that non-coding RNA. So the orange strip in the middle uh, that I'm trying to mouse over represents the coding uh, fragment of our genome interest. And in any variants occurring in that region will be part of uh, the, the protein coding gene. But just, just next to that, there's the sequence, which doesn't correspond to anything coding, but it does contain the non-coding RNA. So variants in that blue area will be annotated uh, to the non-coding sequence, a non-coding RNA. And moving further right on the panel, there's a yet another region that is annotated to both uh, the protein coding gene in the UTR uh, and the non-coding RNA. And in this case, the non-coding RNA will take priority because UTR is less, uh, less of an effect than the non-coding RNA. Um, and it's worth mentioning again that uh, that if you don't want this behavior out of ANOVAR, there's a command line parameter that will force ANOVAR to report every potential effect, making your output a little messier, but perhaps a little useful as well. All right, so far we'll, we've spoken a lot about annotating um, variants to genes, but we didn't mention that genes come from out of a database, and that may actually make a difference. Uh, ANOVAR uses the RefSeq database, so all the, the sequences of genes, transcripts, and proteins uh, are all uniformly coming from the RefSeq database, and uh, that is the recommended behavior for the, this particular software. How, however, other databases also provide collections of genes um, and uh, RNAs and proteins and transcripts, namely the UCSC uh, genome browser and Ensemble all have their own versions uh, of the genome and uh, the genes in, in these genomes. Um, the, I wouldn't say that one database is clearly better than the other, but uh, what I would recommend for sure is that once you stick to one database, use it throughout your entire pipeline, because converting between these, uh, these different databases and the database identifiers can get a little messy. You, you can lose information in it and uh, create situations that you really want to avoid. Okay. So ultimately, besides uh, mapping our variants of interest to genes and saying uh, this particular variant is associated with that gene, uh, we want to predict an impact of what that variant may be doing in order to be able to dig a little deeper into the biology. In the context of cancer, you will, you'd like to find out whether a variant causes an oncogene to become activated or perhaps it causes a, a tumor suppressor to be downregulated or inhibited or disabled. Uh, generally, this is difficult to do. Uh, generally, in the sense that most of the genome is very hard to interpret, but the protein coding genome is somewhat easier to interpret. At least, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of good ideas have been implemented in order to pre uh, to understand protein coding variation. In certain cases, in the regulatory genome, it may be also possible to say something about the impact of variations. Uh, for example, untranslated regions or UTRs are known to be regulated by microRNAs. And if we can annotate microRNA binding sites together with our uh, variants of interest, we may be able to say that the particular variant was affecting a regulatory site in, in the UTR or maybe in the promoter region. However, protein coding sequences are probably the first priority in, uh, in any of these annotation pipelines, and it may be easier to chase down these effects because of the you know, the protein codon and stop codons and, um, and uh, things like that. So when we look at the genes that uh, produce proteins and potential effects that uh, variants may have, then this is a list of variants that uh, from uh, decreasing, in a decreasing order of impact. 
So probably the most impactful mutation that one can have in a protein is an early stop, stop gain mutation uh, that causes a stop codon early on in the protein and it uh, truncates the rest of the protein. Perhaps there's only a little, little tail left of the entire protein, which in the end leads to almost like a knockout effect. And then the, there are these uh, studies showing that many individuals carry you know, genes, of, uh, genes that are truncated, so everyone is a knockout mutant of something. Um, a slightly uh, less um, impactful mutation is a frame shift insertion or deletion uh, that shifts the entire re logic of reading frames by one or two amino acids, nucleotides, I'm sorry, and that leads to a faulty translation early on, perhaps, and uh, sooner or later a stop codon will, will emerge, so that would also lead to a faulty early truncated protein. Um, another impactful event would be a mutation that affects the splicing site. So uh, splicing sites are, are small motifs uh, that are near, uh, near exome borders. And when these splicing sites are altered, that would, could determine whether an exon, an entire exon, is included or excluded from a transcript. And you can see that how that could potentially affect a protein, coding, um, a protein um, function as well. Um, another um, slightly less uh, impactful event would be an in-frame insertion or deletion that would uh, add or remove one or more amino acids. So that, that has to be an indel uh, in the multiply, multiplied by three, amin uh, three nucleotides. And uh, it's more difficult to say what that particular change could do to a protein. It's maybe perhaps easier to say if it affects the well-conserved regions that we will look uh, more into in the next few slides. And then finally, you can have stop losses, which means that the final stop codon is replaced by an amino acid, and the protein continues to be uh, translated from uh, the RNA, and uh, maybe leading to a longer protein that, uh, that has a different function. And then the broadest class probably is the, is the set of missed SNVs, where uh, letters of the amino acid alphabet uh, get replaced by other letters of the amino acid alphabet. Finally, the, uh, the the least likely functional mutation would be a silent mutation, which doesn't lead to an amino acid change. Yet there are studies that some of those silent mutations in protein coding regions may be responsible for rewiring transcription factor binding sites. So even synonymous mutations may have, a, may have an impact. So loss of function variants are a couple of variants uh, from the earlier slides, namely stop gain, frame shift, and splicing that can be considered highly impactful and highly deleterious in terms of protein function. But even then, before you jump into conclusions and start writing up your paper, it's worth considering additional features of these, of these uh, um, um, loss of function variants. Uh, for example, consider the percent of sequence that gets um, that get altered by this mutation. It can be a stop gain mutation, but, we, but if it occurs very late in the protein, then the entire protein almost is functional. And perhaps the protein tail is a disordered tail. It doesn't affect the entire protein that much. Uh, another factor that needs to be considered is um, alternative splicing. So that could be a situation that uh, there is a, uh, an important stop coding in one exon, but in that particular tissue of interest, say the cancer tissue, um, that exon is never expressed. So uh, it, uh, it doesn't matter whether there is a stop codon or not. And split shifting effect is, uh, in general, it's quite difficult to predict because there's, uh, there's a large number of those splice sites, and we don't exactly know their function. So missense variants uh, uh, being the, uh, the largest class and also the most reliable class of mutations, how can we learn more about any individual missense mutation? Uh, we can look at the, the amino acid alphabet and various physical chemical properties of these amino acids. Well, they're not born equal, they are, they are distributed into families, and perhaps a change across the families would be more disruptive to protein function. A very powerful feature of, uh, of annotating and analyzing uh, variants in the genome is conservation. Uh, if a particular position in the genome has been the same for millions of years and many different species, then it's much more likely to be important in disease or maintaining the healthy state of cells. You can look at also features of proteins, for example, uh, the protein domains, the protein secondary pro structure, whether it's a structured region or a disordered region. Uh, 3D protein structures are available. Uh, 
but not for all proteins. And there are software tools that allow you to simulate the effect of a, of a missense mutation in a 3D protein structure, assuming that there's good structure information available. And then there's tons of other features. Um, some work in my postdoc and in, um, in the lab is, uh, is revolved around post-translation modification sites, which are abundant in proteins. And sometimes they are abundant in regions that would be otherwise uh, considered pretty benign. But the fact that there are phosphorylation sites <coughs> and uh, disease mutation enrichments highlights that this is an area of, uh, uh, of study that's interesting. And besides looking at all these different features, um, Separately, there are machine learning tools that attempt to integrate information across these different facets of data uh, and give uh, either classifications or scores about any individual variant. So there are tools that tell you this variant is more likely to be benign, while this other variant is more likely to be harmful for the protein function. Uh, here's an example of BRAF, which is a, um, a very famous oncogene with a hotspot mutation in, uh, I guess, in the kinase domain, uh, where BRAF V600E is, uh, is seen in many types of cancer and it's a target for cancer chemotherapies, um, while V600A is, a, is another variant that has been observed uh, in somatic and germline genomes, but we are not really sure of what, we, what it does. And when you look at uh, this um, and this chemical map of the various amino acids, uh, you can see how, how you could interpret the, the function of this uh, missense mutation just by looking at the physical chemical properties of amino acids. Uh, v and A are very similar amino acids and they are just right next to one another. They, they share uh, chemical properties while um, the V changing to an E seems to be way more disruptive. The molecule has a, has a different shape. It has a, a different hyper hydrophobicity, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, you can interpret that information by just say, you know, imagining the, the possibilities how it could alter protein structure because it's a different uh, it's a different molecule. All right, moving on to conservation and the ways various machine learning tools use conservation to uh, um, establish which variants are more likely to be harmful than others. Conservation is a pro powerful and broadly used idea, um, and uh, we can ask whether for a particular nucleotide or a particular series of nucleotides or genomic regions, uh, how likely is that region uh, conserved uh, in human versus many related species? And we can use that uh, information by analyzing uh, essentially uh, multiple sequence alignments for either proteins or whole genomes. <coughs> And besides, well, it uh, does make a difference whether you look at the nucleotide sequence or the amino acid sequence. And various tools give you a different analysis, whether they focus on, uh, on genomes or proteomes. And some of those tools are the following. Uh, Philo P is based, the on, based only on conservation, and it's quite useful for assessing single variants. Uh, FastCons is a different uh, uh, type of a beast. It allows you to assess um, variants, but also entire regions. And it's useful for uh, regulatory regions as well as proteins. And then multi-species alignment is something that you can visually inspect and study. And it's useful for understanding how the sequence has evolved and which parts are more likely to be more fragile towards variation and which, which ones are very more naturally variable um, in general. <clears throat> Here's a snapshot from the UCSC genome browser. Uh, it describes the TP53 gene. Uh, above and you see that they are quite well conserved and towards the bottom part of the, the screen you can see how different um, protein residues are conserved across species uh, and in human. Uh, so when you have your high confidence variants of interest you may want to go back to the uh, uh, protein alignments and look what these variants look in the context of, uh, of various species in the evolutionary tree. So Philo-P is one of these useful scores. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's designed to test whether the nucleotide substitution rates are faster or slower in the particular region or, uh, or site uh, compared to a neutral drift. And you can use Philo-P in the context of cancer because aligned sequences are available, but you can use it less when you, you focus on exotic uh, model organism. Uh, Philo P scores are either positive or negative. If it's a positive score, it can be it's uh, considered conserved. 
and you can use a cutoff such as uh, the value of 2 to decide that uh, some regions are highly conserved. Uh, 0 means neutral and negative scores mean that these sequences are, uh, are evolving faster than the background rate. And phylos P scores are available for various species and they, it will determine how deep your conservation is. You can look at only primates or all vertebrates or something in between. Uh, the problem, yep. substitution rate is slower, then it would be closer to 2 if the number... Pardon? So the test is to look at whether the substitution rates are faster or slower than... Yeah. If it's a positive number, it's more conserved. So if it's a negative the number, then... Is slower then. So closer to 2 you get, the less it's the substitution rates occur. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, the, one of the main take-homes of conservation is that it will tell you that the position is important, but it won't tell you whether the change in the position is important or which change in the position is important. So only know that the, that region is important in general. Uh, additional machine learning tools and scores will try to improve on that and provide something more. So when you're using the, some of those scoring models in order to assess your variation, then you should keep a few of these uh, ideas in mind. Uh, you can use conservation in a different way. You can look at protein level conservation or you can look at DNA level conservation. One of them will re restrict you to protein space and the other one will perhaps uh, uh, misinterpret or discount features that are only focusing on proteins. You can also study amino acid physical chemical properties, which is a different angle to the conservation. Uh, however, these may be also more difficult to interpret. When you use some of those tools, you, uh, you need to understand which ones are based on scoring, so some sort of mathematical model, and which ones are based on machine learning. And the machine learning ones are usually more dependent on the training data. So ma machine learning will, will help you classify or score variants, but it comes with certain assumptions of how the data sets were constructed and used in the beginning. And the choice of data set may actually matter a lot. Uh, because uh, different types of disease variants may have completely different properties and uh, training your, your machine learning model on one type of data will result on that particular type of data or variant to be discovered more frequently. For example, some tools may be distinguishing activating and gate function mutations in a better way while others may be better at finding inactivating or loss of function mutations. And when some models have been perhaps trained on human Mendelian disorders, they may not be as valid for discovering cancer mutations because it's a, it's a different beast. It doesn't necessarily need to lead to truncating the mutations, but it could activate a protein in a particular hotspot and so on. So one of the first algorithms, or even the quite first one, is called SIFT. It's very broadly used and it's quite old, more than 15 years now. It's designed to find deleterious mutations that are disruptive of protein function. And it's not a machine learning tool. It's based on scoring. And the scoring is relatively simple. So uh, first, uh, you identify a query protein of interest. Uh, then you use a BLAST-based tool in order to find additional uh, proteins that are similar to that protein of interest. And once, uh, once you have an aligned set of these proteins of interest, for each position, you determine the probability of any amino acid in that position. So essentially, you, um, you build something that's called a position weight matrix, which is as long as the sequence you have and as tall as the amino acid alphabet. It's a square. And every probability in that, uh, in that matrix will tell you how probable it is to see a particular amino acid at that position. Then you normalize that matrix, and uh, you'll see uh, in the end of how, how likely it is to see any amino acid in a particular position of that protein. And now they showed in a few case studies that after normalization, um, proteins that seem to have a low probability in a particular uh, position of the protein um, also correlated with, uh, with deleteriousness uh, in, in various diseases. So it's a simple score, and, and it makes uh, certain assumptions, but it's robust but because it doesn't really depend on the particular training set or a set of variants that were used in order to build the algorithm. Polyphen number two is another, uh, is another algorithm in that family. 
uh, it, uh, it's a machine learning based tool. Uh, it integrates various uh, features uh, in order to predict the function of a variant in a protein. There are several feature based, uh, sequence based features that are inputted into the algorithm, as well as uh, structure based um, um, for protein structures. There's uh, uh, things like uh, physical chemical properties of the proteins and also protein domains, multiple sequence alignment metrics, and so on. And then a machine learning tool called Naive Bayes Classifier will, will attempt to best build the best uh, uh, classifier between uh, presumed disease variants and neutral variants. So, and they, they have two sets. The more stringent one will only look at the damaging Mendelian disorders um, and their variants. Uh, and others will be looking at non-damaging differences between uh, human proteins and re related uh, primate proteins. And the more broad uh, set will look at all human disease mutations from the Uniprot database, and the negative set will be any non-synonymous SNPs observed in the human population. So you can see how such a machine learning method can be very powerful, but it will ultimately depend on the input data. Uh, for example, if you select a particular set of disease mutations in the training set, this is what will be captured most likely in your, in your data as well down the road. Uh, the other problem is that uh, there's far fewer well annotated disease variants compared to all the inter-individual variation that's out there. So these training and test sets are likely to be very imbalanced. Um, and then this is an active area of research. People improve these algorithms all the time and try to reduce the inherent bias uh, from these training and test sets. Uh, mutation Assessor is, yet, uh, is another tool in the family. It is not based on machine learning. It's a director theoretical model. It's kind of uh, similar to an enhanced SIFT, uh, but it incorporates more information. Uh, it's based on amino acid uh, conservation, but it specifically attempts to model conservation that's specific to different classes of proteins. So proteins are known to evolve at different rates, and then the, that is uh, inputted into the model in addition to general protein uh, uh, substitution rates. And then they have an entropy-based score that, is, uh, that attempts to uh, predict whether a, a protein substitution is uh, likely to be seen or less likely to be seen. And uh, they claim to be performing really well for recurrent somatic variants, which we need to understand when we look at cancer genomes. Uh, another tool in the family, which is relatively recent, I believe it's, uh, it's about three or four years old, is CAD. And CAD is powerful because it, uh, it allows you to score variants genome-wide. Uh, so for every position in the human genome, it provides a score for every potential nucleic, uh, nucleic acid change. So any, any, nucleot in the, any nucleotide in the genome will, will have a score for any potential nucleotide in the genome that gets changed to in a potential mutation. Uh, it, uh, therefore, it allows you to score proteins and also non-coding uh, areas of the genome, but it, uh, there's a trade-off. So it doesn't incorporate all the good information that we have about proteins because it's supposed to be general, generally applicable to any region in the genome. It is a machine learning model, uh, a support vector machine, that uh, uh, is designed to separate the harmful variants from non-harmful variants. Uh, their negative training set is a set from, uh, is a set from humans uh, compared to the chimp uh, human ancestral genome. However, the positive training set is based on simulation data, uh, and that's, that seems to be deliberate rather than focusing on a particular set of very well-defined elements. They define a simulation model that attempts to generate uh, harmful variants based on our knowledge of what harmful variants look like in general. And as predictive features, they use, uh, of course, conservation, but also many other metrics, uh, namely encode tracks that, uh, that annotate the regulatory regions of the genome, uh, various tracks from UCSC, uh, and so on. And they, they claim to be performing a little bit better than, than just pure conservation because they add all these additional features. Um, and then I'll just show you a couple of slides uh, about their performance, where the thick black line that hugs the top uh, edge the most is an area under curve metric, which appears to be the best for CAD compared to all the other algorithms. OK. So, so far, um, yes? Um, so how about the revenue uh, scores? You know, 
Uh, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I don't uh, think I know what you're talking about. Okay, no, so, so that's, I think it's not a score that combines all the, I think all the methods you were mentioning. Okay. Like you're checking, well, you're comparing mm -hmm. get to the front score, so which, oh. which one is uh, That's interesting. So it's, uh, it uh, performs a, a combined score of all these various algorithms in a predictive way. I think the, the user base can be, yeah, they don't use a lot uh -huh. of things. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I don't know that specific algorithm in general, uh, but uh, that's a very good idea to have various tools to predict the outcome. And if most of them agree, then you are more likely to trust your outcome. Um, the Anovar will the Anovar pipeline that we go through as a tutorial. Will, will allow you to do the, the same in a naive way because it will uh, use these various sources of data and you can you know a almost add up the scores and then rank your scores according to the uh, uh, according to the best score um, I'm about to wrap up this lecture I just wanted to uh, mention a few different approaches that are different from uh, conservation that's the main theme in annotating um, many variants uh, this is uh, a study from Toronto uh, a few years back in science where they were predicting splicing regulatory uh, alterations or, or variants affecting splicing. Uh, so the goal is to predict how single nucleotide variants affect the exon inclusion or exclusion uh, and they used a machine learning based strategy uh, to understand how splicing works in general. So they were looking at sequence motifs in splice sites and also uh, the expression of various exons in the associated genes. And then once they had that machine learning framework in place, they were able to uh, predict um, what mutations may be doing in these splice sites based on the previously observed mutation, uh, the motif composition in splice sites, uh, as well as the uh, transcription levels of various exons. Uh, the, the feature of Perhaps an advantage of this framework is that it does not learn based on known disease or splicing alterations, but it's designed to be more robust and uh, uh, more general than the few examples that we know from literature earlier. Uh, another aspect how you can interpret the cancer variation in the context of, uh, of proteins uh, is, um, is the idea of phosphorylations and other protein post-translational modifications that are very abundant in, protein, uh, in proteins in general. Post-translational modifications uh, are like uh, activation switch or disabling switch in, in proteins. They extend the protein functions. There's a large number of them uh, that are based on experimental evidence, mostly mass spectrometry data, about 130,000 sites in proteins, uh, representing about 12% of human protein sequence. It turns out that the many of these sites are enriched in disease mutations, and especially in cancer. And these sites uh, seem to have less variation in the general population, suggesting that these, uh, these sites are important to be maintained without variation. Um, what's important here in the context of this lecture, um, the figure that you see here uh, shows you how known disease mutations would be uh, classified using some of those tools that we discussed earlier. Um, Black represents damaging mutations, and this is expected because these are disease mutations and they would be damaging. However, orange and red shows disease mutations that are predicted to be benign, according to these various pipelines, uh, yet uh, they affect uh, these various post-translational modification sites, which suggest that uh, if you use uh, post-translational modification site annotations in your, your uh, analysis of variants, you may be uncovering more information that, uh, that wouldn't be shown in, in these various tools like polyphen and SIFT. And then the reason for that is the following. Post-translational modification sites are often not conserved. They are in uh, protein regions that are called disordered regions. And therefore, because they are not conserved, they are less likely to be called uh, harmful by these various tools that rely heavily on conservation. So having additional layer of various signaling sites will help you to perhaps uh, uh, annotate some of the variants that otherwise would look uh, benign. Uh, to conclude this lecture, uh, the main uh, feature in many of these variant annotation tools is conservation. 
and the simple, uh, simple nucleotide uh, conservation, such as the phylo P score, is quite powerful in many cases, and it performs uh, not as well as the uh, complex scores, but relatively well, and it's pretty general. And uh, when you analyze your data using, uh, using conservation, it's always a good idea to check back to the multiple genome alignments uh, or multiple protein alignments to see how it actually looks. When you have these um, machine learning based models that distinguish uh, harmful variants from benign variants, they can be really powerful, but you need to understand their strengths and weaknesses, in particular that they, they have been ultimately trained according to either known disease variants that are that represent a pretty sparse data set, or alternatively they may have been trained using simulation data, and simulation data is always based on assumptions. Um, and when you have your variants of interest, especially further down the pipeline when you have a set of really high confidence variants, you really should work on them uh, just case by case as well as your bioinformatic tools. You just consider the conservation, the various scores, see how well do the different machine learning models agree on the, on your, on the predictions. Uh, you can review the amino acid changes, uh, you can look at the, the physical chemical properties of these various amino acids to, uh, to think how they are affecting the protein function. Sometimes you have access to three-dimensional models that you can simulate to see how, how the variant potentially affects the structure and so on. And don't forget to think about the variant in the context of the gene and the potential networks and pathways that, it, that it's involved in. And this is the theme of the next lecture after the tutorial.